Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Jewelry Makers Guild podcast, where we dive into the creative driving forces of our fellow jewelers. I'm Tanya Davidson, the creator of the Jewelry Makers Guild and a fellow maker of 24 years. It's my quest to learn as much as I can, try as many techniques, buy as many tools and materials, and try to share the, that information with other artists. So I thought it would be fun to find out what inspires our fellow artists and makes their work so incredibly good. Please help me welcome today to my podcast, Nicole Ringgold. Hello, Nicole. Hi. For those of you who don't know Nicole, let me introduce her. Nicole's art is inspired by plants that she encounters while hiking, or it might be a rock or a shell or pizza, piece of beach glass or, and anything that catches her eye in the natural surroundings. Nicole is a silversmith living in Methow Valley in Washington State, a picturesque area nestled in the North Cascade Mountains. She is an outdoor enthusiast. I see her, all of her hiking Instagram posts, you guys should see those. She's also a gardener, a wife, a mother, two fur animals and living animals, a farmer and a world wanderer. Her studio is situated inside a bright greenhouse constructed of recycled materials, and you might have seen that on the cover of Women Create magazine, which came out recently. Many people assume that Nicole's nature-inspired work is cast, dipped, or even electroformed. I didn't know. I was stumped. Instead, she painstakingly creates each piece with silver wire and sheet, and she saws, solders, files, textures, and forms it with hammers. She's, it's incredible. She recreates nature with as much detail as possible to make the metal appear alive. When not in her studio, you can find Nicole with her family and her two Labrador retrievers, tilling soil in her garden or exploring the mountains, seeking inspiration for her next creation. In the bottom right-hand corner of the screen below, you'll find Nicole's website and social media pages. So be sure to check those out and follow her. I will also post at the end of the podcast when it's concluded in the comments, all of her contact information in case you want to check her out. So thank you for joining me today, Nicole. It's so happy to have you here. It's great. I've been waiting for this. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Good. I know you're so busy. So thank you for taking the time. I just, and she just told me she mo is moving her studio on top of all of her other work obligations so thank you for not canceling on me <laughs> i really appreciate it <laughs> as i show as we're talking i'm going to be showing some of your work in the slides and if there's something you want to add about the piece or how it's made or something we need to know please just cut me off and jump in so um, let's start exploring your fabulous work and asking all those questions that we all want to know about you and your work so first of all for almost all of us, there was some sort of spark uh, that came, that happened to us, that led us down this path of creating, whether it was somebody that inspired us or an experience that we had that all of a sudden made us want to be artists. So can you share with us your earliest memory about creating jewelry? Um, for me, it was less about creating jewelry. And I do remember back in, I think, third or fourth grade, um, creating jewelry out of paper clips and tacks. This was in the 1980s where you had colorful paper clips and tacks that had stripes on them and I stuck those in my ear. But outside of that, it was more, what's more important was that I had, I was a special education student and um, was in a learning environment that I struggled to, I, where I struggled to learn. And um, my special education teacher took me aside and did art with me and played musical instruments with me and ended up giving me some tests that showed that I actually was quite smart, but just had to learn in a different way. And that was through art and wow. um, sat down with my parents and, and my teachers and showed them the results that I actually wasn't dumb. I didn't <laughs> need to be in special ed that she just encouraged that I have teachers who could meet my needs and teach in a way that made sense to me. And ever since then, um, I've been able to describe how it is that I learn the best, which is one of the things that drives me as a teacher. I just think it's so important. For me, that was definitely the most influential experience I had as a kid. 
Wow. Yeah. And that, that makes you a better teacher. It makes you a better parent, a better friend um, to understand that people don't learn the same. I'm so visual. And so I ha when people are talking, I'm creating images in my head. So I miss out on a lot of stuff. And I also reverse numbers. So it it does take me a little bit longer to get some things. And um, the visual for me, it works really well. So that's, that's incredible that you were able to um, learn that so quickly and to have somebody there who could help you with that. Yeah. Um, that's wonderful. Yep. That is amazing. She's still a good friend to this day. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Well, I believe along those lines that our art is the current summation of our experiences and those people that we have met that made such a difference in our lives and um, places that we've been and things that we've had to overcome in our lives as artists and as people. Um, so we're sort of like a quilt or a mixed media collage, you know, with the glitter and the glue and the paper and the sticks and all the things you would put on it. So who or what would be the different parts or materials of your collage that you'd be, that can make your work and, and who you are today? That one was a tough question for me to consider because um, I grew up internationally. I grew up in Switzerland and France and then oh. came back to the United States for undergraduate degree and got my um, undergrad in both sociology and studio art because mm -hmm. my whole life I was told that if, if you want to be an artist, you're going to be starving. So I pursued the sociology realm. I went into the Peace Corps in Niger, West Africa, came back to the United States, yeah. got my master's degree in art therapy so that I could try to pursue the two together um, and pursued the sociology, was the director of nonprofits for uh, 15, 20 years and always was an artist on the side. So of course, hiking in my gorgeous environment here and all of my world traveling has inspired my work. Um, but even more so was the fact that we, so in 2009, we finished building our home here in the Valley. And um, it was at that time that I was starting to collect river rocks, drill through them, wire wrapping. And while I was saving, here are my dogs. And stuff. <laughs> Um, while I was selling that work, I was also working full time as the director of a nonprofit organization and started to save the money from my jewelry sales and slowly purchase equipment. And I purchased my first torch in 2011. And then by 2014, I had had I had a whole studio filled with tools. Like you said, we're all tool junkies. And I, I established a goal that in 2014, I would take the next three years and save as much money as I could from my jewelry sales on top of my regular nonprofit director work. And I would take, so all of that, and I would try to save a year's worth of income. And then in 2017, quit my job and I would have a year's worth of salary to fall back on if I, if I needed to. And then I was gonna become a full-time silversmith in 2017. But we lost everything we owned, animals, my studio, everything to a wildfire. Wow. And it was then, um, and that was in 2014, later in 2014. So it was then that my husband just said, you know what, you've wanted to be an artist your whole life, do it. So I quit my job. I got a grant from Surf Plus. I was treated so well by Rio Grande and I started up I established a new studio and got to work. Wow, that's incredible. My tapestry. That's a wonderful story. So, you know, there's always something good that comes out of a tragedy, or at least if you want there to be something good, you can find a way to make it a wonderful thing. So um, ha my hat's off to you for, for persevering. I'm, I don't have a doubt in my mind that that's what you would have done, but um, that's incredible story. Really, really wonderful. Um, I, along those lines, I think the best, um, the best artists are the ones that always have something to say that they want to communicate through every little mark and every torch hole and, um, they have a desire to leave their mark. So, um, what do you think drives your work? Hmm. Um, 
I actually just wrote an Instagram post about this today. My drive is, of course, nature drives my work and my, and like you said, my tapestry drives my work, but even more so is that I am a lifelong learner. And if I become bored, that's it. I, I, I'm going to have to pursue something else. And the thing that's fascinating about silversmithing is that there's, there's no, there's, there's so much room to continue to learn. Mm -hmm. And I just find that brainstorming every single project, especially when it's a new one, figuring out how to pull the pieces together, continuing to learn, and then also being able to turn around and teach that to other people and show them, oh my God, I figured out how to do this thing. It's so exciting to me. So that's what drives me every day, going to the studio, waking up in the, in the middle of the night thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe I haven't thought about doing this. <laughs> I can't get to the studio. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of hats to put on because I, I also sometimes feel guilty. I'm like, you shouldn't spend so much time trying to figure out this thing because you'll never be able to sell it. But then that's like the fun of it to me is the whole engineering of something and then figuring that out. And then you have to put a whole nother hat to figure out how to teach it to someone like, oh my God, okay, I figured this out. Now, how am I going to take them through the steps? It's a whole nother ball game and it's a really fun thing, but keeps, I mean, our brains are gonna be young forever because we're putting ourselves through the rigors every day. <laughs> I hope so, I hope that's true. Well, we won't have to do any Sudoku or whatever that is, those puzzles. <laughs> we have puzzles every day. Sure. Um, so a lot of people get attached to their work uh, as they make it and they don't want to let it go. For other people, it's more about the journey. It's almost that art therapy that's working through that process. And I, I'm pretty sure I know what your answer is going to be. But for you, what do you think is more of the um, impetus? Is it the, do you feel like you need to hold on to your pieces or when you're done with them, you're, when you're completed, you're finished with them and you're ready for them to find a home and you have on to the next idea. Yes, the, the second. I'm much more excited about going on to the next idea rather than holding on to pieces. And I think actually since the fire, that's been my frame of mind. We just don't hold on to things. It, things have less sentimental mm -hmm. value. It's more about I mean, I, I'm hoping that through my art, I'm, I'm sharing my, my heart and my, uh, through my art, I'm sharing my heart and my soul and my surroundings mm -hmm. and my, um, every, I'm trying to share a bit of myself and put it out there in the world. And I'm hoping that the, my customers are seeing that and feeling that, but I'm much more excited about the process. Yeah, yeah, no, you can see, you can see all of your hikes in all of these pieces. I see your dogs in these pieces. I definitely feel you when I see your pieces. So you, that definitely comes through and it's it's beautiful. They are, your sculptures are fascinating. And I wanted to like give him a name, like um, Andy Cooperman calls things that he torches and forms into something else, torch deformation. And I'm like, what does she call this? What, you know, what is this? It must have a new term because they're so fascinating and evocative. I mean, I look at it, I can see that flower out in nature on the hillside, I'm wondering what the color it was in the, in nature. It's just, it's really intriguing. And I, I totally am amazed by them. Um, you could have waxed cat, you know, carved the wax or done 3D printing or, um, and cast them or done, like you said, electroforming, which didn't occur to me until I read that. But you chose to do all of these things with the torch and it's an additive and a, a de, 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 deconstructing process, I'm sure, through that. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you developed this technique and how you stumbled upon it? What was the driving force for this? I think it started when I was playing around with wire scraps and trying to figure out how to make a branch and playing around with just moving the, it's kind of, I kind of think of it as like painting with my torch. Mm -hmm. So when I move my torch across the metal, the metal will, you can manipulate the metal with the heat. And so, I started it with wire and then when I realized I could do it with just wire 
And then I started to experiment with making dragonfly bodies. And then that moved on to bigger forms, like frog forms. And I, I just found out that I could move the metal with the heat, recognizable blob. <laughs> and then I would take that blob and carve it so that it was much more recognizable. So all of the carving is done with my flex shaft then. And I don't really have a title for that or a, a, a term. I don't know. It's You'll have to think of something. I came up <laughs> it's, it's very unique, I think, to you. I don't see a lot of people doing it. It must be a very freeing technique to just say, I'm just going to apply the heat and it, see what it does and not be afraid. So many new artists are so afraid of melting something down and you're actually trying to melt something down, which is so empowering. I know when um, I fuse gold to steel, it's really empowering for new students because they're like, wow, I can apply as much heat as I want and I don't have to worry about it melting. No, we're trying to get the gold to melt on the surface. So it's so like, oh, if you love fire, it is such an incredible technique to do this. I, I'm, I, as I told you, I had been waiting to take a class from you and then COVID happened. So one of these days I'm gonna make it to your place to be able to try this out. And, and then you taught at Vivian Magoo in January or February in Tucson, and I was teaching, so I couldn't take the class, but it is very fascinating to me. Um, I think I forgot to forward through the next photo, so we'll just kind of look at these incredible um, leaf and green reforms of vegetation forms. Oh, you have them on, they're beautiful. You know. That's the other thing is you can't you don't know the the size of something when you see an image you're like is that teeny tiny or is it big so it's really nice to see them on your ears. That's incredible. Yeah, and, so, and what you mentioned about with the students they, having it be freeing. So often I have students who are quite advanced come to my studio, which for me is shocking because they have been taking silversmithing courses. They they call, many of them call themselves workshop whores. It's yes. it's kind of funny, to me, but. Um, I, I've never taken a class before, so for me, it's just fascinating that people want to come and learn from me. Mm -hmm. um, it's a huge honor. But what they do say frequently is that when they leave my class, they're not nearly as afraid to, you know, drop. I, I'm not going to drop an f bomb here, but they're <laughs> not as worried about screwing up. up yes, because they know that they can take their silver and melt it down and turn it into something really unique and interesting. Yeah, that's really fun. Really fun. Um, do you have uh, another technique that you like to do besides this torch deformation sculpture work that you do? Is there something else that, you know, is it the hammering, the rep, the chasing repose? Is there something else that is just an incredible thing that you like to do besides? Um, you know, I think my favorite part is the brainstorming part, picking a plant and saying, what am I going to do with this? Or how am I going to try to create this? So for me, it's the brainstorming thing. And then if I just did the sawing every day, oh my, I would be, I would not love my job, but I love that I can do a little bit of everything when I'm working on a piece. I can do a hollow form and add that to the branch that is that melting and fusing process. I can saw and then use chasing tools. I, I love the every, I love the variety. So yeah. not one particular thing. So there isn't a second best of bridesmaid. They're all bridesmaids. What? They're all bridesmaids. All the techniques that go into your oh, pieces. Yes. <laughs> they're all bridesmaids. There's no, not a, a, what is it? Um, oh, I forget now. It's been so long since I've been married. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. A runner up. What is that word? <laughs> I messed that analogy up. So anyway. Um, you, I asked you to send me a picture of something that was your work in progress. It's on your bench. So you sent me this piece and I am, I put it up today and a bunch of people are like, what is that? So can you tell us a little bit about this piece and I'll just work through the slides, the pictures and, and tell us what you're making here and what the process is through this, this piece. Oop. Well, I find it's kind of interesting that um, I always forewarn my students when they come to my workshops that when they reach a point where they're all in a groove, I'm also gonna work alongside them. 
Um, and of course, they're my priority, so I'm, I'm interruptible. But it's during my workshops that I often find that I come up with new techniques or um, projects that I, I do projects that I never re really would have thought of doing otherwise. And I'm, and one of my students in the last workshop I held in my studio brought in a seed pod that was round and had all of these jagged points out of it. So I started making this hollow form. And then I thought, mm, I don't really want to make this seed pod. What can I do with it instead? So I decided to make an allium. <laughs> I think I bit off more than I can chew. Um, and I drilled, that's probably about 500 holes. And wow now making the individual flowers and soldering them to the stems and then the stems are all going into the holes mm -hmm. and then they're all secured so if you were to look inside they're all soldered into those holes so the entire thing is going to be flowers and it's not a tea infuser but every single hole is going to have a flower and each one of those flowers you sawed out the petals mm -hmm. yeah because they're all a little bit different when you look at them. They're not pancake dyed out. They're, they have their own little character, and that's quite incredible. And, yes, you're a little bit nuts. So you were looking at a monkey ball. <laughs> were you looking yeah. at a monkey ball seed? Yeah, those are fascinating. I would think that would be a really fun project to take on. But this is a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's going to – someone – when I posted that on Instagram, somebody commented – Oh, I can't wait to see this unfold. It'll be like unwrapping a Christmas present. And it, I think it literally will be unwrapping a Christmas. It's going to take me until December to finish that thing. Well, that's one of those things that you then enter into the Saw Bell Awards. You know, it's something you would probably right. never do otherwise. And something spurred you to make that. And you'll learn a lot through that project. You'll learn how much patience and fortitude you have. Yeah, I'm gonna figure. I'm gonna need to figure out how to solder the two components of the hollow form together once all of those flowers are in place. It looks fun, though. Huh? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be something you'll have to keep posting the progress on your Instagram so we can follow along and see where you're at. Where Where is it at now? How many more flowers does it have? Twenty or forty flowers. I made forty flowers and added them to what, the content there, and it didn't look like I made much of a dent at all. So maybe, in, maybe in a hundred flowers, I'll post it again. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so is there something that you do daily to prepare for your creative day? Is there something I do daily? Um, I try to go for a walk every day, hike or something, um, because I, in some ways I have to unwind my brain before I get to work. I often bike to my studio mm. or um, my new studio is actually not going to be in the space pictured, but it's going to be on, we have a, the largest Nordic ski area in the nation and our house is on the, our home is on the ski trail. So I'll be skiing to work. So exercise. When you wow. That's fun. I love yeah. that. Um, you'll just have to make sure you have a place for your skis and your boots when you get there, like a little yeah. wet room or something. Yeah. Um, I know you love to teach and that you currently have online classes available. So if anybody didn't know that, to go to your site and check that out. But aside from teaching, what does your perfect studio day look like? Do you start early? Are you a morning person, evening? No? <laughs> um, I, I really try to set boundaries. I go to my studio and... Um, right around eight or nine and I'll work until five or six every day. Sometimes weekends, but I try to take a couple of days off per week. So I work, I really try to treat it hourly like a job. And um, my ideal day honestly is I'll go into my studio and either I will walk around and find a plant and that com something completely different and then explore how I might create that plant or I'll take a jar I have jars and jars of natural rocks I'll take a jar of rocks and I'll dump it out onto the counter and then I'll sift through it and find one that inspires me and I'll start working from there nice. that's my idea bag, just to just and I listen to audiobooks I'm a bit of an audiobook addict what do you like to listen to sci-fi or romance uh, or historical fiction huh. Yeah. 
I, I can't listen to audiobooks because I I have to pay attention to them. So I always end up rewinding, rewinding, rewinding. <laughs> so I have to listen to something that is just background noise. Otherwise, yeah. I can't concentrate. So I, I admire people who could do audiobooks, though, because I have a whole bunch of them that I've never listened to, just like books that I buy that I never have time to read. And I just You'll have to go on a road trip. Yes. Yes. Road trips are great. So um, how do you manage, you, you're so busy with teaching and making, how do you manage your business tasks, your marketing, your packaging and shipping and sourcing with actually making work? I consider myself a very efficient person, um, the kind of person who recycles things before I probably should. Just because I like my countertops clean, I'm. I'm a minimalist, so um, in the morning, I'll get up and I'll respond to all the emails I can and try to streamline everything and everything that I've read and done with, I delete, 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 and I try to keep my inbox down to about 20 emails. That's the kind of person I am. Um, and then I'll do all of my invoicing first thing in the morning, and then once I feel like all of that's clear, I've caught up on communication, then I'm going to sit down and I'm going to just create. So I spend most of my day creating. And then if I'm posting and doing marketing, and all of my marketing is through Instagram, which then shares to Facebook, mm -hmm. that's all I do for marketing. And I'll do that generally in the afternoon or evening. Nice. And then that's that. And then packaging, um, I used to list all of my items on my website when each piece was complete, but I found that that was just way too, that that was just made my day too frantic. Mm -hmm. So instead now I only list about 20 to 30 new items once a month. And I put everything on, I photograph everything one day and list it on my website for preview the next morning or whenever the time is for the release, I'll put everything over to live and then the, the packaging happens that day or the next day and I'm done. That is a very efficient way to do it. I, I know quite a few people that do it that way. And it's, um, you get scarcity and urgency with your buyers also. And so it's a win-win, I think, all the way around. Yeah, I do a lot of custom orders. I would say that about 50% of my work is custom. Really? So with that, I, yeah, um, with that, that's where in the morning we'll, where I'll do my communication, I'll often get between three and five new custom orders per day. Wow. And so then I'll just put them, I have them pay up front. I can't deal with billing afterwards. So they pay up front. And as soon as the, it's the invoice is paid, I print it out and it goes on my bulletin board in the order of payment received. That's how I fill them. Nice. That's smart. And so do you have any tips on dealing with, um, with custom orders, like uh, managing expectations on the part of the customer with what you're going to deliver? I do not fill custom orders unless um, it's I'm, I have artistic license. And generally, all custom orders are in response to something else I have created, and they missed out on it on during the shop update. So sometimes it's a hey, can you make more of these Monstera earrings, or can you turn one of those into a necklace? And I see that you've made this chain in the past. Can so it's generally always within the realm of what I've done before. The most recent one was, or, or the most interesting one recently for me was a woman who asked me to create this little, um, oh, what's, dinosaur that her, from a daughter, from a drawing that her daughter, her four-year-old daughter had done. And that was the most outside my box order I have ever had. And I said yes, because it seemed like it would be a really cool challenge. And she gave me such license with it that I had, I had a great time. And I usually send pictures along the way to the, to the customer saying, is this kind of the direction that you are hoping I'm heading in? And it's usually, yeah, keep going. Nice. That's really rewarding when you have um, clients who are, who are on the same path and allow you to do your work. And your work, yeah. your work speaks for itself. So either they know that they want that kind of work and it's gonna be organic and it's gonna have character and it's gonna have things to it that aren't 
high polished, perfect. So that gives you a nice leeway. Um, and that that's incredible. It's, uh, it's nice to see somebody who is busy and has a process and it works and it is fulfilling. Yeah, very, thank you. Yeah. Um, artists seem to either love or hate the process of selling their work. And it doesn't sound like you have a problem with it. So this is probably a dumb question, but um, <laughs> how do you feel about selling? Do you enjoy the process of selling? Are you a pushover? Are you, do you, you feel like you have good boundaries with selling? And then what methods besides, in, you said Instagram, but is there any other, um, do you do any shows or any open houses or trunk shows or anything? Mm -mm. Now, before I was doing my botanicals, I used to sell, I had 25 galleries that I'd sold my work through and it was just so hard to keep up. And then the more, when Instagram started to take off for me, I pulled out of all but five galleries and then I, then it, I was still overwhelmed with the, even that. So I pulled out of all the galleries and now only um, market through Instagram. That's all I do. I don't, and yeah. I don't find it, I don't have much, I personally have not experienced much trouble with selling. That's, that sounds great. It's every artist's wish right there. Dream wish. <laughs> <laughs> and I, during COVID, I did offer, and I put this on the Jewelry Makers Guild today. I think you saw the, the links. I was, yes. during COVID, did offer um, some classes on how to use Instagram to your benefit, because I really think there's kind of an equation that goes along with it. And mm -hmm. so if there's interest in my sharing those classes, they were recorded and I'm happy to share them. They were free. And um, so if interested in understanding how to use Instagram, especially to your benefit, I'm happy to share that. Yeah, that's awesome. I might actually repost it in a separate post if that's okay with you. I saw that today and I'm gonna watch them for sure. So yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. It's very generous of you. Um, so we were talking earlier that I like to take classes because for me, it's about community, which is one of the reasons that I started the Jewelry Makers Guild group. Um, just having a community to share tips and techniques and questions like marketing with other people. But when we're in our studios and we're working in solitude, we all also always, some of us have our little assistants, which are not always so helpful. So tell us a little bit about, and I don't know if anybody heard, but my dog just threw up like five minutes ago during this. I was like, oh gosh. So no. she's not feeling too good, I don't think. But tell us a little bit about your beautiful Labrador retrievers. And then you have a little surprise too that comes into oh. the farmer bit, I think. Um, so that one there, the brown one, chocolate one, his name is Chaco and he's right here. He's a bit of a spaz. He's he's harder to have in the studio because his tail whacks everything. He mm -hmm. takes my my torch and I find things on the floor quite a bit. But um, he's a love. And then my other one, the black one, is named Sabe, and he's um, fifteen. He's fifteen. So wow, he's a big old bear. He's just a sweetheart. Does he still go hiking with you at fifteen? He very short hikes nowadays. Yeah, yeah. struggle. 15 is a long time for a lab. You're so lucky. Yeah. Does does he have a black mark in his tongue? Or is that a he shadow? Does. Yeah. <laughs> That's cute. Right. And how old is Chaco? Chaco is five. Cool. And then you have the farmer. I was wondering where the farmer came in. So how many chickens do you have? Well, um, those are actually shared chickens at the studio where we all pitch in and take care of them. So those are at the studio space and there are about 10 of them. Wow. Um, and before before we lost our house, we had 38 chickens. We had horse. We, I raised rabbits. We had a pig, two dogs, and two cats. No, back then we just had one dog and two cats. So we used to have a lot, but not anymore. Not after losing everything. Yeah, that's hard. Once once you yeah. lose animals, um, I, I've always had animals. I'm act, I actually do own a farm in South Dakota. Um, and I showed horses for eight years or 10 years. So I miss all of that. And I'm definitely a huge animal person. So I love this, but I've always wanted a chicken, but or a rabbit too, but never, never ha had that. And I don't think I have time to give to that, but yeah, they're very time consuming. Very, very time consuming. 
I have learned so much about your creative process and your drive, but I always want to know what tools you like to use so, um, and why you love them. So let's share with our viewers your top 10 a la David Letterman style. I don't know if most people even know what that is, but he used to do that top 10 thing at, at the, his show every night when I was a kid, and he'd start with number 10 and work his way down. So. This number 10 is your <laughs> Fret's Miniature right. Steaks. It's okay. Fret's Miniature Steaks. So I'm assuming you use those for your hollow forms and your undulating shapes? Those I use for, yes, uh, hollow forms. Shells, I use them to make shells and um, that allium form. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you have this whole set? I love them. Yep, I have the whole set. I love yeah. them. I have just a few of them. I'm, I'm going to get some more of this next year because if the Tucson Gem Show happens, he usually has a really nice booth and um, he has deals on some of his hammers and parts. So, yeah, I'll add a few every year. I love those. Um, and your number nine is the Durston Dapping Set. And I use, choose that one specifically because when I've taught at other studios, um, when they haven't had the quality Durstrom, the my hollow forms, when I'm trying to elongate them, they get stuck in the other blocks. And then oh. with this one, I have never, ever, ever had that issue. It's high quality. And I have been able to use it regularly to like make a longer form such as an acorn. Oh, nice. Yeah, um, I don't have the nicer set, but I always wondered what the milling difference was. So it's obvious that you find that there's definitely a difference between the two. Okay. Yeah. Um, your number eight is the Swanstrom Disc Cutter. I have this one. I love it. That one is on my list because I finally purchased it when I, after the fire, when I had this new studio, because up until then I had been sawing out all of the circles and filing them down. <laughs> <laughs> that, yep, that sounds like a little nutty to me. But I see that you are a half patience that I don't have. <laughs> Your number seven is your Silkwar soldering table. And I also love the Silkwar, but I use the one that's the round one. And yeah, they're great, aren't they? Yeah, and the, what I love about this is that, again, when I've taught on other um, soldering tables, platforms, when I do the fusing of the sterling silver scraps, it gets, the, the sterling silver gets stuck to the platform. And then it's almost impossible to get the platform out of the silver. So um, this is, the one platform I've been able to use that doesn't yes. doesn't fall. Yeah, and stuff um, stuff like my flux, I spray the flux and it will stick. But then I just take some hot um, pickle, pour it on it, and scrub it off with a brush, and then it's like brand new. And you can't Great. do that with a solderite board or vermiculite or any of those. So it's like, I can just clean it, it's brand new again. I, it's a really great soldering thing that I don't think a lot of teachers talk about or people know about it when you mention it. So yeah, that's nice. I like the square you one too. About the, you just taught me something about the flux and the pickles, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, your number six is the GRS double third hands and I love this. I can't live without that one either. Yeah, and for those, when I work with my students, I teach them a lot about how to use heat sinks to your benefit because mm -hmm. I don't use chemicals. I don't want like to. I don't use the no flow or the uh, uh, whatever the pastes are that you put right. on there. Right. Instead, I use the heat sinks to draw the heat away from previous solder joints. So, um, and then of course I use them to hold my work because none of us can be an octopus. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very handy thing to have. I think the G whole GRS system is brilliant, but this is definitely a nice tool to have. And um, I have one at both of my studios because I just couldn't live without it. It's kind of heavy to carry around, but they, it is amazing. And those little things come off too, which, yes. and yeah, and you can change out the board if you want. I actually remove the board and don't even have mine there because I use my turn, my silk bar oh. turntable there, and it fits yeah. perfectly in that space. Yeah, it's a wonderful tool. I like this one in particular because it has the double joint arm. Yes, yes. And those, they take a lot of heat and they don't warp um, like your tweezers or other things. Real quality made. Your number five is the Eastern Repose Chasing Tools. I think those are made by Fretz too. Are you still there? 
I think we might have lost the connection, but hopefully she'll be back. So I'll go through number four, which is her Harbor Freight drill press. So you can get this at Harbor Freight and they usually have um, coupons available too. Um, I'm assuming this one is fairly large. I saw it in her studio photo. Hopefully she'll come back if she has something to say about that one. And nope, we lost her. So the number three is the Fordham flex shaft. And that is um, the SR model that has the forward and reverse. And then her number two is the Anvil. And uh, from what I understand, the company that makes the Anvils out of Loveland, Colorado are getting ready to retire. So you can find some of them still at Farrier Suppliers. Um, I don't know, this is a cast iron one, I don't know who will be carrying those in the future, but if there's an alternative. And her number one tool that she loves to use is the Little Smith Torch because she uses that to create her sculptures. And I know she's sorry that she is not here, but it was at the very end of the podcast and this sometimes happens with Zoom. But I wanted to thank her for her time and thank you guys for attending. And, sh and she shared so many nuggets with us about her creative process, which I just loved hearing about. I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, you guys, don't forget to follow, like, and enroll in one of Nicole's upcoming classes. Um, check, to be sure, check her Instagram pages and her, um, her website. And then be sure to check out our previous podcast interviews, which you can find in the group. Soon you'll be able to find them on uh, YouTube and an Apple iTunes account. But our past interviews include Jane Redman, who is a wonderful artist and also makes her own tools and teaches, and Julie Sanford, who owns a large studio and teaching facility in Grand Haven, Michigan. And she's also an amazing artist. And then our last artist was a knife maker and metalsmith, uh, Delana, who makes these beautiful knives if you haven't seen them. And she shared her process and all of her tools. Next up, we're gonna have Roberta Peel in just two weeks. So join us again on October 21st, uh, also at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sorry we lost Nicole at the very end and I hope you enjoy the podcast. You guys have a great evening.